Okay, so the next topic is um, resistance. <clears throat> so what is it that opposes flow between pressure at point one and pressure at point two? Okay, if I hold the delta P constant, so 40 to 20, right? And it's 20, delta P is 20. Um, what is, what impacts flow at a constant pressure difference. This is called peripheral resistance or just resistance, how difficult it is for blood to flow from point A to point B. So <clears throat> resistance is the opposition to flow, okay? So flow, the way to say that is that flow is inversely proportional to resistance between two points, or as resistance increases, flow decreases, okay? The primary determinant for um, resistance is friction. So anything that adds to the friction between point one and point two um, will add to resistance and therefore decrease flow. So let's talk about the things that do that. Um, the first one, well, let's just look at the concept of resistance first. So the concept of resistance basically says that in these two situations, at least theoretically, although I have a, um, a bone to pick with the way that the figure was drawn, um, pressure here, pressure here should be identical, although we can see that A and B might not be identical because water actually has some pressure on top, but let's just go with it. So, um, there are, let's say there's identical pressure at point one and point two, right? So I've got the delta P that's a 40 millimeters of mercury. But with this one, what happens is this one has less resistance because there's a larger tube and this one has more resistance because there's a smaller tube. So the delta P was held constant, at least theoretically, but the resistance changed and therefore the flow changed. Okay, so let's talk about some things that can actually impact resistance. The first one is um, just vessel elasticity. If the vessel wall is stretchy like it should be in a healthy artery, then what happens is it will kind of balloon out and snap back and actually aid in flow. So um, a good healthy elastic artery will aid in blood flow, but that's not always the case. For instance, you can get your blood vessels all gunked up with arteriosclerosis and arteriosclerosis not only narrows the lumen, which adds to resistance, but it also is sometimes called hardening of the arteries because a lot of times these plaques that occur in the wall of the arteries will not be soft and squishy, but they'll be hard and crunchy, especially in the later, later stages. So if the vessel isn't nice and elastic, it won't balloon out and then snap back. And please note when it snaps back, if there's a valve in it, it will help to aid flow because the valve closes and the snap back is almost like a little pump that's in the artery. Okay, um, the next one's not shown in any, any of the figures, but it's really just um, how thick the fluid is, and that's called viscosity. So viscosity is the thickness of the blood. So just to give you an example, it will be harder to pump maple syrup than whole milk, because maple syrup has a whole lot of friction within the fluid itself, okay? Um, so this is resistance to flow due to the friction within the liquid. Now the viscosity is relatively constant in a healthy person, so it's not going to change much over the course of a day. But if your hematocrit changed a lot, and hematocrit is the proportion of dissolved solids that are actually in the bloodstream, um, if that changes a lot, like you get leukemia or something like that, then the blood can become way more viscous or um, erythrocytosis, it could become more viscous. Or if you became really, really dehydrated and you lost most of the plasma and you basically just had really thick, viscous blood. So the viscosity can impact the resistance just because the fluid will be harder to pump. And then the next concept is really just the vessel diameter. And so there's a couple of different ways to think about this. So if we think about these as three different vessels, which one, the, ves the general trend would be that the larger tube, right, has less resistance and therefore more flow, like bigger tube, bigger pipe, more flow, smaller tube, less flow, okay? So that's the general trend. Now, is there such a thing as a tube being too big to maintain flow? Yeah, like with an aneurysm, if the dang thing balloons out and it's no longer a stream, it's a lake, you can have too big 
to maintain flow. So here's the general trend. Let's just fill it in while we're here. The general trend is a larger tube gives less resistance and therefore greater flow. Cool, cool. Um, with the exception of too large a tube. A smaller tube gets, gives more resistance and therefore less flow. Okay, now with this figure, let's say that these are all the same vessel. Now we can um, locally and temporarily do constriction and dilation of tubes. Okay, so the diameter of a vessel and therefore the resistance can be changed really dramatically by regional short-term vasoconstriction and vasodilation. So all, all um, vessels, except for capillaries, have smooth muscle in their wall. And the smooth muscle always has a little bit of contraction to give it tone and strength in the wall. And that's just like the called ar arteriolar tone or vessel tone, okay? Now, how do I allow for vasodilation and vasoconstriction? Well, um, remember a lot of times this is initiated by the sympathetic nervous system. It doesn't have to be though. If the smooth muscle in the arterioles con contract, for instance, before a capillary bed, that is termed vasoconstriction. And what it's doing is decreasing flow to that organ, okay, by increasing um, resistance. But if the smooth muscles in the arterioles will relax, then it will vasodilate before a capillary bed, increase flow to that organ, okay? So these are regional short-term changes. So let's fill these in real quick. Okay, if the smooth muscle in the arterioles contract more, then they will vasoconstrict before a capillary bed, and that will decrease flow to that organ. If the smooth muscle in the arterioles relax, that will vasodilate before a capillary bed, and that will increase flow to that organ. Okay, now, um, which of these, so all of these four, Vessel elasticity, viscosity, vessel, oh, I didn't do vessel length. Let's give, do vessel length, sorry about that. Vessel length, um, so this is just basically saying if you have a longer tube, right, um, it's going to take more pressure to get from point one to point two. If the tube is this long, not much pressure is needed to get from point one to point two. The tube is this long, more pressure, and the tube is this long, way more pressure. So the longer tube gives more friction and therefore more resistance. If you want the same amount of flow, you're gonna have to bump up the pressure to maintain the flow. So longer tube gives more friction. Here's a metaphor. If I was blowing milk, uh, whole milk, about the viscosity, same viscosity as blood um, through a tube, um, if I was, if I had a six inch tube, I could get over that amount of resistance relatively easily with a relatively low pressure. If I was blowing the same volume of milk um, through a six foot tube, I was going to have to generate a lot more pressure to get over that level of resistance, okay? All right, so let's go back to the end because I forgot I was talking about that. Okay, so um, although elasticity um, in the wall, viscosity, vessel length and vessel diameter all impact resistance. I really only used one of those four um, as a primary mechanism of controlling resistance because the other factors don't change very often. And the one that I use primarily is the vessel diameter. I do constriction and dilation to control flow, um, to control resistance and therefore flow. Okay, we'll stop there and I'll do auto-regulation of flow.